to start recording. All right. Yeah. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks again for coming out tonight. As you can see, we're talking tonight about call stream Go and C, C++, and also how to call Go from dynamic languages. My name is Dave Raffensperger. I'm a software developer at Crew, which is a global nonprofit. You can read about us at crew.org if you're curious. And the primary stuff we're going to be doing tonight is looking at some practical code examples. All those code examples are in this GitHub repository. I also posted it on the sli um, meetup slide. And I'm going to post the talk slides as well. So if you're familiar with Seago, hopefully you'll learn some new tricks. If you haven't seen it before, don't sweat all the details. You can always come back to this. So let's look at the first example. How do we call C code from Go? So this is where the magic happens. We, this is just a, a regular Go file. But then we have this special import here called import C. And that's the C Go import. And the comment that's above this import C is actually interpreted as C code. So there's a comment within a comment, and then there's these pound includes, and then we're defining here a C function. Really basic function, just add two numbers and print, print out what we're doing. So the way we call that C function is quite simply to use the C package and then reference the C function, C.add, and then we can print out the result. And then we can also call functions that were in a library that we pound included. So one example would just be something from the C standard I.O. library, put us. So we can call put us here with a, with a string and, and print that out. One caveat here, whenever you're calling from Go to C, you have to be aware of the difference in types between C and Go. So for instance, the string, Go has its own string structure, whereas in C, a string is essentially a null terminated array of bytes. And so what Go has done is they provide a, a couple of nice wrapper functions here. The C string function converts a Go string into a C string, a null terminated string. And there's a corresponding Go string that takes a C string and turns it into a Go string. But the tricky part here is that C string <coughs> is actually allocating memory on the C heap. And that's outside of Go's automatic memory management. So we actually have to free this memory, just like we had done it with malloc and C. So what we can do is we just call again another C function, c.free, and we want to pass in a void pointer essentially. So in Go, that's considered unsafe.pointer. So we cast that to unsafe.pointer. And a nice idiom, you may have seen this in Go and other places, is to use defer when you're doing cleanup. So here it's really trivial. We could have just swapped those two lines with no problem. But if you had a bunch of things going on down here, multiple exit points from the function, it's nice to call defer to make sure that however you exit the function, you'll make sure to call free. And you can also group the allocation right with the free, so it's conceptually uh, connected. So let's go ahead and run this and see what it looks like. So we just do go run main.go. I can see the output there. So it's doing the addition, it's getting the result, and it's, it's printing. So cool. In a nutshell, that's how you call C code from Go. But let's, let's look at the reverse. How would you call from C back into Go? So let's say we had an adder, but this time the adder is going to call back to Go with the total. So what we're doing in our main function is we're saying add and give Go the total. So we're, we're just passing in those two numbers, and we want C to, to call this function give Go total with the total. And so the way we can expose a Go function to be callable to C is, we, we again, we have this import C. That, that clues go in that we want to use the C Go. And then there's another special comment, this slash slash export. And what that does is it tells Go we want to expose this function as callable from C. So then here's what it looks like from the C code side. So we've got this add and give Go total. That's the function we're going to call. And what we have to do is we pound include this underscore Seago export. You can see Vim here is complaining. It says, Seago export file is not found. And the reason it's not found is because it's actually auto-generated by Go. So whatever functions you have in your exports, Go is always going to regenerate that file as it, in, in its temporary work directory as it builds your project. And so you don't have to worry about that warning, but it's just interesting to know that. And then to call the function, we just quite simply say, give Go total. So one thing I want to highlight here is that this, this, this parameter is also a c.int. It's not a go int. 
And depending on your compiler, your environment, the C in and the Go in could be different sizes. That's just something you'll be aware of. Whenever you're converting between Go and C, you have to be aware of this difference in the type system. So let's run this example as well. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to run Go build. And what that does is it builds not only the Go files, but also any C files or C++ files as well in the directory. And then here we, we, we got this um, output to C and back. And there we see, OK, we, we're calling C to add the numbers. And then C, C gets the call. And then we call back to Go with the answer. Do you have a, do you have a question there? Yes. Uh, that's all statically built into to C and back? Yes, it's all statically built in. The, the examples we're going to look at tonight uh, except for the interpreted languages, are all going to be statically compiled. There is an example in the repo I shared of calling a dynamic uh, C library, and there's some special tricks to that. that I'm, I'm not, I don't have, to, I just don't have time to go into, but it's in there. Yeah. Is this Go 1.5? This is this is Go 1.5. This this type of thing should work in previous versions of Go. Some of the other examples we're going to see take advantage of the new Go build modes, but this is just the basic C Go stuff that we've had for a few versions. So any, anything else or? All right, so let's, let's take this a step further. What if we wanted to call C++? So here's an example of C++ class. Now, in the C++ class, there's this method distance to. So say we have a point, we've got an xy coordinate, constructor, destructor, we want to take a distance to another point. Now, you could imagine in a C++ library for geometrical objects, there could be distance to for circles, polygons, all kinds of things. So when C++ generates object code, it doesn't just generate one distance to. It, it generates a distance to in the context of that class, that template, that function overloading that you're doing. And so C++ does some extra decoration to the symbols in the object file. Some people call it name mangling, kind of a negative term, or name decoration. And so that means, though, that Go cannot call directly into C++. What we can do, though, is we can create a C function and we can use a special indicator, x turn c, to, to tell us C++ compiler, hey, export these symbols, just ordinary symbols, and then you can call from Go to C and C to C++. So that's how you can call C++ with Go. Or sorry, yeah. So what you could do is you could write that wrapper by yourself. You could write a C wrapper function for your, for your um, C++ class, and then you could write a Go wrapper function for your C code, and then call Go, you know, your Go wrapper. But there's a tool called Swig that automates some of this for you. So if you go to swig.org, you can see sort of all the different options that Swig has. You can do type mappings, like standard string to go string. And there's a bunch of different things you can put in a Swig interface file. This is sort of a minimal Swig interface file. We're just saying we just want to create a Swig interface for the point class, point.hxx. And so what else? This, this point package is considered a Go package. And in order to tell Go that it is a Go package, I need at least one .go file, because otherwise the Go compiler co complains. It's like, this is not a Go package. So we just have this one thing, package point. Other than that, all of the files in this package are C++. So here's the definitions to these functions. It's basically printing out that we're constructing it, printing out that we're destructing it, and then we calculate the Euclidean distance between the two points. So what's interesting, though, is that we could use this package with C++ and Swig from Go and pretend like it's a Go package. So here's what it would look like to sort of pretend that it's a Go package. It is a Go package. So we're, we're, we're including this package. It's really long because it's part of this examples folder. But then what we're going to do is we're going we're to say we're using this Swig wrap C++. And what Swig's going to do for us is it interprets the constructor, and it's going to create a Go function called new point. So we're going to pass in the x and y coordinate to new point. That's kind of an idiomatic way. Go is not exactly object-oriented, but that's sort of an interactive way of having something like a constructor is, say, this new point. And similarly to that C example, we need to free the memory that we allocate with new. So there's a corresponding delete point. And then we've got, we'll create a second point, and then we can calculate the distance too. Now, one thing that's different here is you notice a capital D. The reason Swig did that is because you probably are familiar, to export a function in Go, you have to capitalize it to make it public. So Swig converted that, but other than that, that's just our distance to function. And we're calling, again, we're calling this auto-generated Go code that's calling auto-generated C code that's calling our C++ code. Um, so it's kind of a long chain, but it works. So let's do Go build again. We're, we're statically building it in, and then we can run it. Oops. Okay, so here we've got, it's calling a C++ wrap code. 
We're constructing the two points. That's from Cephal plus. Then Cephal plus is finding a distance. Go gets the distance back, square root of two between these two points. And then the defer calls are executed in first and last out order. So we destruct first two, two, and then one, one. So, sorry. So again. if I'm interpreting this correctly, the Go tool chain is automatically calling swig. It's not. You don't yes, have to... it's automatically calling okay. swig. So I want, that's what I want to get into next, actually, is what is Go really, what is the Go tool chain really doing? So if you use go build dash x, that shows you all the commands that go build is running. So it's kind of hard to interpret here, but there's a lot going on. Um, but somewhere up here to the top, you can see this is the temporary folder that go build is using. And then right here is the call to swig. And so this swig call is taking that point dot swig cxx. So the go build tool chain automatically interprets uh, dot swig cxx and dot swig as swig uh, interface files. And if it's data swig cxx, it passes that little dash C++. And that's the indicator to say, hey, this is a C++ sort of name decorated environment. We need to make sure we're careful about how we ex export the symbols. So go build is taking care of that. But what I want us to do is actually sort of get into the innards of what Go is actually doing here and look at some of that auto-generated code to better understand sort of how Swig is working. So there's another call we can do is go build dash work. And what that does is it outputs the temporary work directory, but it also keeps it around. So you can then CD into that work directory and see all the temporary files that Go is doing. So if you think back to that example where we called from C to Go, and we, in, in, we included that H file that didn't exist, well, that H file would be one of the files that would be um, in this auto-generated code. So let's take a look at that auto-generated code. So you, can, you guys might remember the um, cgo export.h. We're not really, there's not really anything in here because we're not exporting Go functions, but it's in this, it's one of the temporary files. So what we're going to focus on here is let's first look at this point wrap.cxx. So you can see here it says this file is automatically generated by Swig. And the, it's not meant to be human readable, but we're looking at it. Um, and here's it, it says the source is that, that swig interface file we made, the, the point.swigcxx. So I'm just going to kind of move through this. This is a bunch of boilerplate code. Um, it's, it's pretty similar between different calls. Uh, but like, here's where it kind of gets interesting. So we're including our class declaration, the point.hxx. And then here's the thing I talked about before, this extern C. That's telling the C++ compiler, hey, all the symbols in here, these C functions, I want you to export them when you create the object code. Make the, don't mangle them at all, just regular names. And then we can call those functions from Go. So what, the, what's this, what are these C functions doing? So here's one that's this wrap new point. It's taking two parameters, the x and y coordinates, and it's calling new here um, with, with, the, with the point, and it's returning it. It's got some other wrapping going on, but that's essentially what it's doing. And then similarly here, there's a, a delete point. That's a C wrapper function. It calls the delete with the argument. And then here we've got a wrap distance <coughs> two. And this takes two points as arguments. And it's going to uh, call distance two on the, on the points and then return the result. So that's sort of step one of the wrapping. We're wrapping C++ with C. And we're ex so we can export the symbols and make it call from Go. But the second step is generating this auto-generated Go code. And here we've got, again, we've got the sources point that swig cxx. It's auto-generated. And here we've got the uh, C Go preamble that we saw from the other examples, this import C. And then what's going on here is those C wrapper functions I just showed you that are making the calls to the C++ code. We're, we're including those here with, with extern references. So then we can call it just the same way we were, we were calling C in the other examples. Um, but this is just auto-generated code. So let's take a look here. So this here is a new point. So that's the function we called in our main function, sort of the pseudo constructor for the point. And what it's doing is it takes the inputs and it's calling this C wrapper function. And it's using the same C go syntax, it's just saying, C dot wrap new point with the hash on it. And then it's doing what I talked about before. It's converting the float64, which is a go type, to C dot double. And those should be also 64-bit floating points, but in principle, they're different types. So it's casting it to that 
So that's the, the new point. And then here's the delete point. So it's doing this very similar thing. It's calling the C function that's, that's wrapping delete. And then here's distance 2. It's taking a, um, this swig pointer, and it's calling the C wrapper for the distance 2 function. And it's passing in both, um, both the first argument to the function, which in Go is sort of like what comes before the dot, and then it's the, the second argument is that other point. So it's passing it in as two arguments to the C function. And then here's our, our Go uh, point interface. So all that is basically auto-generated code. And, and sort of there's a trade-off here. So the advantage is if you're going to change your C++ code a lot, you can use Swig and, and you add a new function to your class, bang, you can call it from Go without having to rewrite the wrapper. The disadvantage is if something ever goes wrong, you're, you're paging through these ugly files. So there's sort of a there's sort of a trade-off there, but it's cool to know that that's something you can do. It's something in your toolbox to be able to call C++ in this way. And I show another example of uh, what it would look like to just write your own wrapper for C++. So do you any questions at this point? Or yeah, I'm sort of what I'm waiting for. Probably you're going to talk about this later, but you already alluded to the heap being different, right? And the Currency is the thing that I'm really kind of curious how it plays. Yeah, yeah. Let's make sure we get to that. I want to cover before I need to jump into the performance of the concurrency, um, but let's first just jump into another kind of fun aside, which is how do we call Go from an interpreted language? So to call Go from an interpreted language like Ruby, Node.js, Java, Python, we would, essentially it's very similar to how we call Go from C. So we do this import C. We've got this export add, and then we need our main function. It's not required, but Go just complains we don't have it. And then we can do, we've got a make file here. we conditioning on the operating system for the extension. And then here's where the magic happens. This is, this is new in Go 1.5, this build mode C shared. There's a similar build mode C archive to do a, a static callable C library. And this one, it's a dynamic library. And then to call this, say, from Ruby, there's a Ruby FFI gem you can include. Uh, you you say, where, where's the, um, the dynamic library, you attach the function, and you call it. So, so I'm going to run make here. So it calls go build. And then one thing I want to show as well is it's going to actually generate an, a .h file for the go code, and, and that um, defines the different go types. And then it's going to um, have our add function. So if you wanted to call this dynamic library from C, you already got an H file you can include that's automatically generated. So then let's just run these examples. So we've got all these languages calling go, the addition function, they all get the results. So you can look at the details of how you do how you do that. Um, do you use C types in Python? Uh, yeah, it uses C types. Um, let me find the Python example. Yeah, it uses C types here. So we use C types. And yeah, again, a little conditioning there, load the library, and then we call it. So yeah, there's an FFI thing for Node.js, Java. Uh, there's a couple different ways to call native. Uh, I use the JNA. That's a little easier. So, um, so that's how you call Go from dynamic languages. The, and so let's, let's get into what you were talking about. What's the, what's the performance and concurrency implications of all this? So there is a cost to these cross-language calls. And a call from Go to C, it's about 50 times slower. And on my machine, it took 160 nanoseconds. I have a benchmark in that folder that, that calculates this. Uh, whereas a regular Go call uh, to a no-op, you can actually force Go to not inline functions and do a proper benchmark. So a regular Go no-op call is about 3 nanoseconds. And the reason for that is that it, the Go runtime has a slightly different type of stack than C runtime. There's kind of a, a switching cost involved. And similarly, for instance, for Ruby, it is about a 30 times slower than a pure Go call. But if something like Ruby or Python, Java, potentially, you could get a speed up from Go if you're calling a compute-intensive um, function. So don't be afraid of the cross-language call, but don't call them in a tight loop, because that will be slower than um, making the loop in Go itself. So what about concurrency? So <clears throat> this word also gets interesting. So Go has these uh, nice feature of Go routines. You can just very easily. Uh, multiplex a whole bunch of these Go routines onto a limited number of operating system threads, Go max prox threads. But the caveat comes when you're calling C is that once a Go routine enters C Go and for 20 microseconds in the current interpretation, it's considered blocking. It's like as if the Go routine is trying to open a file or a network connection or something. 
for all it knows. And so that blocking C code, which could actually be running compute, it thinks it's blocking. That's not <laughs> counted towards the go max prox limit. So we might have to create a new operating system thread. So I did some benchmarks of this, and you can re you know, see the code. So I did uh, something where I had eight go routines, and go max prox equals one. And I did a compute intensive workload. I split it up evenly between the eight uh, go routines. They're all calling C to do the work that's going on. And what happened was, when I just ran pure go with, with eight, eight go routines, go max proc one, it only used one CPU core. But now it used all eight cores because it's spinning up new operating system threads for all eight go routines. So that was a case where sort of an unexpected extra concurrency um, came about. But here's where it kind of went wrong. So I tried 800,000 Go routines. And with pure Go, there's no problem uh, because it's multiplexing those 800,000 Go routines onto a limited number of operating system threads. But with C, it thinks those are all blocking. So it keeps allocating new ones. So I got P thread create fail. So basically, the operator said, I'm not going to give you 800,000 operating system threads. That's too, it's too much resource intensive. So you can still do a lot, but um, so that's that's kind of the concurrency and performance implications. So yeah, I want to uh, finish up here for questions, and then if you want to, we can dive into different things as, as we have time. So yeah, any questions at this point? Yeah, sure. Is uh, is this into the Go test uh, coverage profiling uh, tools? In terms of the benchmark? Yes. Yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll show you the example of the. What the benchmarks looks like. Um, so the go no op. Um, so I've got this main test. Yeah. So it uses the the, the go benchmark, and so we've got this um, go to see no op, and we've got the go only no op. And so the run benchmark. This is where we just say uh, we're passing that. That's a magic compiler flag to say don't do inlining, and we. Um, we run the benchmark. So let's go to one benchmarks. So I don't any so 151 nanoseconds for the go to C call and 3.13 nanoseconds for the pure go call with inlining disabled. If you if you enable inlining it's it's a lot less because it just inlines the null. So yes, it does that one does some of the other benchmarks I didn't. I just used time, the, uh, you know, and I ran different like the Ruby ones and, and some of the other Go ones. So um, yeah, they don't all use this, but the no op one does. When do people find it necessary to call C? Yeah, um, I I think that, so. There's a lot of things. So so one example is is the end of last year, people did a study of GitHub. And about 1% of repositories were in Go, and about 3% were in C, and about 4% were in C++. So right there, you've got 7% of GitHub repositories are in C or C++. There's a lot of scientific computing. What got me into was an op a linear programming optimization library that I cut out of the talk for sake of time. So a lot of those types of pre-established algorithms that somebody really has thought about this for years and written a really good C or C++ um, library for it that you could rewrite in Go but you'd be wasting a lot of time. You could just call it easily. So that's one example. Um, you may have a legacy C code that you want to rewrite in Go, and you're like, okay, well, let's rewrite part of it and call it, and then re you know, so you could, you could. That's another example. So, have you run into sort of like memory manage issues with calling C and Go with the garbage collector? Because I can imagine there's some cases where you may, well, I just know one example. I, like I try to pass in an object so I could have uh, C call back Go and be able to reference that object that got garbage collected. Do you have any interesting ideas or thoughts on how yeah, to Yeah, I'll show you I'll show you one um, one thing that's kind of related to that, um, which is so this is the this is the linear programming example. I didn't have time to somebody asked about calling a, a dynamic library. This is sort of the way you you're passing in uh, things to link to a dynamic library. So this is an example I didn't really get a chance to go into, but one of the things that it has is so I'm wrapping this um, uh, C structure, a C pointer, uh, it's a linear program, basically. And I actually set up a finalizer. So in this new LP, I, I call here this C.make LP, okay? So I'm allocating memory on the C heap, all right? But this is actually contained in a Go structure, this LP struct. Now the Go structure itself is under automatic memory management. So Go is free to garbage collect that. 
So what I could do is go provides a finalizer. So I could say in the go finalizer for my wrapper go object, go ahead and delete that C object. So what you could do is you could you could wrap all your C allocation in these sort of go objects, and then you know the finalizer could then as they're deallocating to clean it up. Yeah. Is that uh, kind of wrapping that Swig would generate for you if you asked it? Uh, Swig, so in the example we saw, Swig generated an explicit delete point method, so you had to call that delete point. Uh, to my knowledge, you can't, Swig doesn't offer the exit opportunity to do a finalizer uh, type thing. You, uh, you know, maybe if you hacked it, you, you could figure out a way. But the way Swig did it is it just very rotely said, here's your constructor, here's your destructor. Because, you know, yeah, th this is kind of a specialized thing. The other thing was I... Well, finalizers aren't... Liable. Yeah, they're this is, like Java. They they may run. <laughs> yeah, this is the other thing. This is where I was going to get to. So here, here, you know, for my example, to force the finalizer to run, I called the, the garbage collect three times. So <laughs> so it's kind of like you know you you know it'd be something that'd be good to if you have a large application. This could be a cool technique to try to help you get around it. And maybe if your C structure is not too big, it'd be okay. But yeah. Yeah, so so basically, like what he, like what Kent said, you know, your mileage may vary with the finalizers, but at least it's a cool idea, and maybe it's worth trying depending on your situation. Um, so I understand the time constraints, but I was actually interested in part of the box. Is this confident? Yeah, yeah. So let me let me just I'll just pop ahead. So this is this is uh, I'll just give you the, the thirty second one. So uh, this is what got me into Seago is wanting to run do a linear program and go. So linear programming, really simple. You've got continuous variables. You've got linear constraints. Uh, it forms basically those constraints, hedge it into like a polygon or a polytope. Uh, you want to find an objective function. Um, and then there's an existing library, LPSolve, uh, that I used. And then to, to call it, you, you just, um, well, the, the tricky part is you, you want to make sure you can locate, make sure that Go can locate the library. So the trick here is these uh, LD flags. And, and passing in um, the library. And I actually, uh, for Mac, I installed with Mac ports. And so there's, um, you can actually specify a build constraint to say, on Darwin, do these, uh, link it to this um, library. On Linux, link it to that library. Um, and uh, then, you know, there's, um, uh, I just do some basic wrapper functions for like adding constraint, setting objective function. Um, one interesting thing here, real quick, is let's see here. To pass a an array to go, you you um, you can actually pass the address of the first element. So we're we're taking in a go um, slice here, the row, and we we pass in the address of the first element. So I, I'm sorry, I wanted to talk more about it, but as I practice it, it like wasn't going to fully fit in the time. So. Yeah, I want to be respectful for our next speaker, but me. I'm just curious to know, does Swig help us call Go from C++ as well? Uh, I'm not as familiar with that. I, my understanding is that Swig is designed to create wrappers for C and C++ specifically, not just for Go, but for a bunch of other things. Like we were talking about Python, a um, variety of other languages. Um, so it does. its specialty is wrapping C and C++ for dynamic languages or Go. Um, so my understanding is, Kent, did you get yeah, thought of Yeah, basically you can make it work. Um, and I assume you have to go back the other direction. C++ calls C and C calls Go. I think what happens is you're going to control it from Go, but you can construct it so that C, C++ can call into Go once you've done that. All right. Awesome. Um, maybe you know this already, but I noticed in your uh, C Go flag at the top, um, for Linux, you have a relative path, um, and uh, in Go 1.5, they added a uh, special the source the yeah, source thing. Right. Yeah, so. yeah, I saw that, and I, I hadn't I hadn't yeah. I hadn't fixed it yet. But yeah, that's that's good. That's a good call. Um, Just curious if you had time to play around with the channels in relationship to any of this. I did not play around with channels, but I'll show you what I did do. Um, so. Get back to my extra window. So for the Go concurrent one, um, what we've got is it's not a channel, but it's this weight group. So you're basically saying, okay, here's all our Go routines that are calculating different parts of this sum. And what we need to do is 
we need to um, to say how many how many are in the weight group, and then we're going to weight on the weight group. So we can do we're we're having them all do parts of the sum, and then we're uh, pulling together the parts of the sum. It's basically calculating a harmonic series. So it's on a channel. You could you could do it with kind of a way with a channel, but they have this nice weight group thing for this particular situation. So all right, well. Thanks, guys. I'm happy to chat with you uh, later afterwards. But um, yeah, I want to give the floor to Kent. So. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to uh, type Vim in the middle of my talk. So, um, it's great of you to uh, do all my typing before the talk. So. Um, Okay. Hi. Um, wait. Oh, God. I started the wrong talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, I did that talk at work. <laughs> that was for a bunch of Java programmers who'd never seen Go. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, I want to talk about microservices, and I'm going to start with um, my background. Um, I was at Linden Lab with a couple of these fine folks for a few years. Um, at the time I was there, we had 40,000 CPUs on the grid and quite a bit of interesting scaling issues there. Um, then I went to Disney. Um, we were building systems for uh, a whole lot of simultaneous users, Facebook games. Um, and then I went to a nonprofit called Tidepool, which was doing uh, secure health data in the cloud. At um, the hope is to move to some serious volume. So um, started working with a lot of microservices there. And there we started off with Node and then migrated to Go. Um, and then now I work for the Achievement Network. Um, as I mentioned before, we're doing secure student data for assessments. Um, and there we have. The stuff we have right now is a bunch of server-side Java delivering completed web pages using GWT. And um, I was kind of brought in to help us reconfigure new architecture that's going to do more JavaScript on the front end and, and go microservices on the back end. So I've been building a bunch of microservices in this uh, world. So um, what are microservices? Um, the structure I'm talking about is um, David Weinberger had the phrase small pieces loosely joined. Um, and he was talking that about the general architecture of the web, but, but I, it applies well to microservices. What you're trying to do is to isolate small functional blocks so that each of them is easy to maintain and manage and deploy and, and convert and, um, and then hook them together in a way that is um, not very tight. Um, so <laughs> you start off, you want to define an API. You want to think of your back end as an API. And usually you do a RESTful API. And um, hopefully you at least passingly familiar with that phrase. I'll talk about it a little bit further in, in a minute. Um, then you partition your, your API into sort of manageable pieces. And then let those stand alone as services. Um, and you hide them all behind a router, which then doles out tasks to the individual services corresponding to the requests that are coming into the service. Um, oh my goodness, I'm behind a slide. I'm really sorry. <laughs> what happened? OK. Sorry about that. So um, what do you get? If you do this right, you can get some really nice features like zero downtime deploys. Um, that was real news to my current organization when we came in that I could 
stand up a new version of the service and take down the old one without any user ever noticing. Um, you get a really nice capability for horizontal scalability because you can deploy more instances of things to handle volume. Um, the individual pieces are smaller, easier to manage. Um, my, you know, measure of the complexity of a program is how many people, you know, how smart do you have to be to hold it all in your head? And, you know, some of the theoretically best engineers are the ones who can hold the biggest programs in their head, but they write the code that's hardest for other people to work with because they're holding so much in their head at once. Um, so reducing that code complexity helps. And reducing coupling, um, and I have paid in blood in a bunch of times with systems that are so heavily coupled that it takes weeks or months to make changes to them um, because of all of the things you have to make sure you don't screw up. Um, and so the result is that you get a lower rate of acquisition of technical debt. I mean, technical debt happens, you always go, oh, I'll fix it later, write to-do in the code, and ta-da, you know, um, and you never actually get to it. But the rate at which that happens is, is really what can drag you down over time. And so microservices, I believe, keep you um, much less likely to accumulate that at a rate you can't keep up with. What is it not is a silver bullet. <laughs> um, microservices don't work everywhere. They're not the right solution for you. It doesn't eliminate complexity everywhere. It just it moves it. <laughs> um, your individual services are simpler, but you have a more complex system to manage them in. What you hope is that the rate of management is sort of, you can have some tools that help you do that. And they make it easier to do the common tasks, and the uncommon tasks maybe get a little more challenging, but it's, it's, it, I think it's worth it in most of the systems I've worked on. Um, I think for ex an example of a contraindication when you probably don't want to think about microservices is if your database is requiring transaction systems where you're saying, okay, I need to lock the world, do a bunch of changes, and then commit it all at once, and those things are happening across multiple services, that's not a good time to be doing microservices. That just, I think, I think coordinating that's too painful. I'm curious if you're going to get to the QA implications of this. <laughs> I'll talk about that. Yeah, um, it. The short answer is, <laughs> I've been working in worlds where where explicit QA is harder, and so you're writing a lot of good tests. The the nice thing about microservices, they tend to be very very testable. So you you. Um, you know, code coverage analysis helps you decide how tested they are, um, and then, you know, writing those standalone tests. The nice thing about Go is that the damn tests run so fast. Um, it's hilarious because we have a bunch of microservices in Go, and my build and deploy process for those is measured in seconds, um, including testing. And when I build and deploy the JavaScript code, which is theoretically interpreted, it takes 30 to 40 seconds to do that. Uh, <laughs> So, um, anyway, um, this is a quick image of the general architecture we're talking about. What, you know, I have here is there's a VPN, there's a load balancer. If you were talking about, like, Amazon in our case, this is an Amazon-provided load balancer pointing to our router, which then distributes the individual requests to individual services, and the services communicate through a shared data store. Um, they can also communicate this way. Um, that adds coupling, so you need to think about whether you really want to do that. Um, okay. Briefly, RESTful APIs. Um, so the premise is that you're using HTTP to fetch and store, so you're defining your APIs, a series of URLs. Structured properly, you want to think about what are you accessing as individual resources. That's the R and URL. So name your resources and then figure out how you access it using get, post, delete as your, as your verbs. And typically you're going to communicate with JSON or XML. In Go, JSON is pretty easy. Um, communicating with JSON generated by JavaScript is sometimes a pain in the butt, but that comes from the way that JavaScript is kind of tight. We had an API today which had a, had a um, parent and child relationship, so a recursive data structure, and except that 
the organization that filled out the data structure used different types for the same variable names at different levels of the data structure. So I had some that were ints and some that were strings. It's lovely. Um, and the, the thing that's interesting here is people always ask, oh, what are you using for templates? Go templates have problems. I don't like Go templates. Well, I don't use Go templates. <laughs> Everything's JSON. Um, feed out to JSON and then render it client side. So that's why I was saying when I'm hiring, I'm looking for somebody with Angular because we're doing client side application that fetches these APIs. Um, so here's a chunk of Go code stolen from um, our the user server we're building. It's not all of the endpoints, but it's it's a sort of proper subset. Um, so we're using a multiplexer, um, third party multiplexer called Bone. Um, and that just parses these URLs and handles um, substitution of parameters. And it calls these functions, um, get token, keep alive and stuff, um, and that get token is a post, and um, keep alive is a get. And then these, this is middleware, and I'll talk about middleware in a little bit. Um, so when you have an individual service, you want it to be a standalone process, and you want it to not care where it's running. So you might have one server with 10 processes on it. If you're running your development environment, there's not much load. Um, when you get into production, you can start peeling them off onto their own machines if you need to, or running some of them on a big machine with a lot of you know, horsepower. It, it shouldn't care. You're addressing all of these things through HTTP um, and inside your VPN. And so you can, you can kind of run your services where you want to do. Um, the nice thing about this is you can build these microservices in any language you want. Um, and on my previous gig, we had some of our, we started off in Node, and so stuff was written in um, JavaScript. And then over time, we decided we were not enchanted with Node anymore, and we moved more and more things to Go, or built new systems in Go. And we had a mixed system. Some of them were JavaScript, some of them were Go, and I even built one in Python for the fun of it. Um, they're all fine, you know. So they can just talk to each other. The nice thing about Go is you're deploying a binary. So what's great about that is the deploy server um, is, like, empty. <laughs> it, it's just got enough to bring it up and running, and then, bang, you drop a binary in it, and your, your service is working. Um, this is really important if you, want this, if you want to be able to scale and make this stuff work. You don't maintain local state. I mean, you can do this. There are all sorts of systems that will allow you to kind of pin stuff to servers. Bad idea. Just store state outside your server. Um, you can use memcache if you need high, highly responsive systems or Redis. Um, or you can put it in your database. Depends on kind of how responsive everything needs to be. Um, but don't pin sessions to servers. That, just, that, that way lies madness. I did it at Disney, and uh, I don't want to do it again. Uh, <laughs> um, and the idea is if you do this right, you can run multiple copies of service, services, and the, the router will you know, round robin among them and, and share that load. Still have a question? So that is the limit to your scalability. Your horizontal scalability is your database load, right? Yeah, it, it is potentially a limit, but there are interesting solutions for that depending on, on exactly what your problem is. Um, for example, at Disney, we had, um, we had a very interesting database problem, which was we've got users who are, they log in, they load game state. So there's a big read of like a megabyte when they log in. And then after that, the server is running client side, and it's doing a write every couple of seconds. It's so it's piling data down the, down the pipe as writes. They never read again. What we did was we read, we would cat, we'd do a read through on a cache, so that they, so any read we were doing was to the memcache, and then every write was just buffered in a memcache um, and then periodically flushed. So the and and the back end was a was a massive collection of Mongo servers 
which which did eventual consistency on writes, but everything was buffered through the memcache, so we didn't care about eventual consistency. That just it it just eventually sorted itself out, and that worked very well. And of course, since it was game data, you know, if you had the where occurrence were all server crashed before it had a chance to flush, somebody might lose five minutes of progress um, in their game, and that usually wasn't fatal. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so the other thing I would say is it's always a good idea to include status monitoring. Every one of my endpoints has a slash status, and delivers a standardized status block, which looks kind of like this in its current incarnation. It just tells like where the server is, what port it's on, what its name is, um, and a bunch of configuration information, including how it was built. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, which revision you had in your VCS, which version you called it, um, so that you can kind of look at your collection of running services and see what's actually running. And you go, oh, gee, look at my tag servers. I've got five of them running, and one of them's a different version. No wonder I'm getting one-fifth of my data messed up. Um, Normally, you don't see that, but if you do something stupid, you will. <laughs> yeah? Are you using any particular tools to help document your API routes in Go? Like, if you use Swagger and the other tools that... So, that's an interesting one, because I started doing this stuff with Go RESTful, yeah. which supports Swagger rather nicely. The trouble is, Swagger really doesn't play well in a microservices environment. I was going to have to write a lot of code to make Swagger flow through, and it's turning out that the sort of infrastructure behind Swagger wasn't worth the trouble to me. So now I'm moving away from it. Yeah? Have you looked at Jason's schema? Yeah, I've been using that. I've looked at him in the past, not in the context of Go. Well, I mean, it, it, as you said, it has nothing to do with Go, really. It's more yeah. about describing your RESTful interface. Yeah. Interesting. I'll have to think about that. Yeah. So when you talk about like the Richardson maturity model with RESTful services, um, how do you feel about like data, data IS as in terms of like you know you're writing your services? Would you prefer to have discoverability instead of documentation? Yeah, I mean that's that's a really interesting model. I haven't pursued it personally because you know it's always those. What do you? When you're talking about an internal API, if I were doing, if I were still at Tidepool, like at Tidepool, actually, my previous gig, we were using JSON schema for describing the the schema that we were to, that we were planning to accept from third party APIs. This is the stuff I'm working on right now is entirely internal. So basically, we're writing the same clients that we're using to access the thing. So it's mostly just tap your neighbor on the shoulder and ask them how it works if you if you can't read it from the code. So, um. You know, the, we started off with all great intentions, building like beautiful um, Swagger APIs and stuff. And over time, that kind of fell off. I still the code we use that ha that uses Go RESTful. Actually, it, it we took the time to do all the correct documentation. But the thing I showed you earlier is the more recent one, and I'm kind of liking it in part because it's so tight and small, um, and and there's not there's not a lot of complexity there. Um, here is something you might see for a, a production, a more of a production environment if you're going to do this. You could imagine the, the blue box, the blue ovals are, are individual machines. And so the discovery service can be parallelized and share state through a Redis cache. And then um, you could have multiple Mongo instances, say, for your database if you're into Mongo. Um, and um, in my opinion, of Mongo has, has Actually climbed quite a bit over the years as I moved into this thing. When I first started using it, I hated it, but now I kind of like it. Um, and um, you know, you can have your services running on multiple instances, and again, they don't care much. Um, so when we're talking about Go in particular, um, I like JSON. Um, Go RESTful actually gives you the ability to just say, "Oh, I'm going to accept XML too." It makes it stupid easy to do that, and it works. Um, and if we start talking to Java services again, then I might turn that on, um, because the Java people really tend to like XML a lot better. But I, I'm, you know, my recommendation is bias toward JSON unless you need something else. Um, 
this, if you've been following any of the Go buzz, you know, people are like, screw Martini. You know, you don't need, <laughs> you don't need these crazy complex frameworks. You need, especially for microservices where you're talking about something small, um, don't pull in massive quantities of code just because it has a bunch of features that you think are cool. Um, the Go libs are actually quite good, and so part of the thing is the most recent project I took, I said, you know what, hands off, let's try it using just the basic Go libs. And that's where I came down to, I said, well, I'm going to use the bone router because, because I just don't feel like writing in mux, you know, multiplexer. Um, but, I mean, some of the stuff like Gorilla, Gorilla's pretty good. I was using Gorilla type pool and pretty happy with that, and it's nicely partitioned, so if you just want to use Gorilla mux, go for it, you get, get a few extra features. Um, also, if you want, if you don't mind taking on some syntactic sugar and you're just trying to share some state among, not, you know, within your process, you want to pass state around, you can use Google's context um, stuff within Go's HTTP. I haven't done much with that, so I don't fully understand all I know about it at this point. It's, it's something I've been seeing people do. Um, and... You know, so basically the statement is start with the basics and then add what you need rather than starting with a giant bucket of crap and trying to figure out what you don't need or sticking yourself with things that you don't want. For example, one of the things that's most interesting is Go RESTful has a different signature for handlers. So you can use this technique, but you have to modify it. Um, this is what Go middleware looks like. It's a function that returns a function. So it takes a handler and it returns a handler that wraps the original handler. Um, so log requests just takes a handler, returns a function, which is a handler that takes a response rate of a request. It just logs the result and then calls the original handler. Um, and then this, you know, that I have other middleware. And then this one was just one that I used as a little syntactic sugar to make it you know, this composes two of these log requests and count requests um, so that I have status data available. And um, that's just a very, very simple technique for doing middleware. You don't need the whole JavaScript middleware thing. Um, it's nice. Oops. And what happened? Um, in terms of organizing these, one model, the model I use, is to store a service in its, each service is in its own Go project with its own repository, um, and then there's just one repository that contains shared code that is used um, with GoGet to, you know, in, in all the other projects. So common code is in that one place, and everything else is just a standalone service. That's great if you're doing open source. That's great for, um, for allowing these these things to be stood up and used elsewhere and keeping your coupling low. But the other way to do it um, would be to kind of have them as individual packages within a single project and go, and, and they kind of can know about each other. Um, it might, might, you might find some of your tooling easier to do that. I haven't done that, but I've, I've seen people recommend that. So um, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm deaf on coupling at this point. Um, <laughs> and so I... I I'm like, just give me separate repositories, separate things. Um, I'm also pretty opinionated about the way you build and deploy stuff. So I have um, kind of an opinionated configuration model. One is you vendor your dependencies so that, you know, the things you build, you know what you have when you're building them. Um, and you've developed and coded against the things you're building with. Um, and then the release process is you build everything exactly once. When you're, when you're ready to deploy something, you've committed it to master, you version that, identify the tag, and you run a build and then store the binary generated by that build. I mean, we do it on S3. And that is forever tagged as that. And if you try to build that same version again, it won't lay it. Um, and so if you want to make a change, you've got to rebuild and redeploy. And the point is that that same binary, if I tell you that it's version 10.1 of my tag server running on this machine, it's the same version 10.1 that's running on that machine and every other machine, including whether it's development or production or staging or whatever. 
Um, that's the same binary. The only thing that differs from deploy to deploy is configuration. So anything that needs to differ needs to go in the config. And then separately, like this, I mean, my configs that for one server is that big. It's just uh, it's just a shell script, and defines a couple of environment variables that are used by the server. But those things are the things that could change in configurations, and so those are the only things that we we modify. And we also build in version to configurations, and that kind of looks like this. I have a tool, build artifact. I tell it which which repository I'm doing, and there's a little lookup table that tells it how to find that, um, and um, you know, tell it what version I'm building, and it checks it out on a clean repository. And I have a special build machine, which is an AWS machine set up to do builds. So it has Go installed, and for the, the JavaScript stuff, it has JavaScript and Node installed. But our production machines are completely clean. They, they're basically just enough to get Linux up and running, and then we drop... So we build the artifact, store it on S3, we build the configuration, we store that on S3 as version numbers, and then to deploy on the launch, on the deploy machine, we just say, go get those two things, lay down the, lay down the um, artifact and unzip it, then lay down the um, unzipped environment and call start.sh. And that is all, you know, so there's a build.sh and a start.sh in every repository, and these scripts run that. And it's it's remarkable how clean this is. I mean, I do a new build, check it in. Um, I mean, version it, build it, deploy it in in about a minute. And it works it works really well and um, and you don't run into the problems of what did you actually build. With Node we had a huge problem with this where we were building and getting burned by people like deleting versions of dependencies and I don't want to go there. Yeah. So this kind of um, structure loads a particular machine really lightly. Yeah. So it kind of um, slants you towards using VMs, and AWS <laughs> you know works well in that scenario. Maybe. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that are. I mean, Docker is built with Go, and everybody's excited about Docker. To be quite honest, I've played with Docker twice and walked away from it both times because it doesn't seem to provide any value to me. The, the architecture I'm talking about already lives in, you know, lightweight machines behind a firewall. And so I'm just not, what Docker, the benefits Docker gives me don't seem to justify the work I have to do to make it all work. Your mileage may vary. Uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not saying Docker sucks. I'm just saying it didn't. It didn't seem to do anything that I felt I needed. Um, all right. So I want to talk about routing. Whoops. Um, the routing piece is kind of critical. Um, you have to take your URL API and split it up so that a request comes in. The router analyzes that request and diverts the request to the the target place. The easiest way to do that is to think of it as um, a URL, I mean to chop off like the first segment of the URL and have your machine, your, your API sectioned into just like if it says slash user then it means go to the user API and if it says slash tag go to the tag API. Um, and, and so the router also though wants to have multiple instances of those APIs so that it can do a round robin among them and, and be a load balancer. Um, you know, this, this part is the thing that I think is critical about that. When you start talking about stuff like this, you know, I forget who said this, but the goal is to reduce the number of places that know how many machines you have and where they are to as few places as possible. So, um, that is the structure behind the router that we, that we've built called Vasco. Um, and that last comment should probably be on the next slide, but basically you can have a router where your services <coughs> register with the router by themselves so the router gets told who's alive and all the services have to know who the router is. Or you can configure the router with some sort of configuration and tell it how to find the services and it can start all the tasks and manage that kind of thing. So it sort of depends on where your pain is mm -hmm. and what you're most worried about. Um, I prefer the flexibility of a system under early development. I'm preferring the flexibility of a router that 
deals with services that register themselves. So I can start up a service and know that it's accessible. Um, in a world that was more, um, you know, less in development and more in kind of constant production, I'd probably lean more toward configuration that I could control it in one place rather than having the individual services. But it, it, that's, a, that's a design decision, an architecture decision. It's not, it's not a must do one way or the other. Um, so the router um, we built is called Vasco. Um, and it is a router, manages the distribution of requests. It also does discovery, so it allows the services behind the firewall to find each other by name. Um, and that turns out to be something I built but haven't used. <laughs> um, load balancing, it, it supports the idea of multiple strategies for how it distributes load. And again, that's something I haven't done. So far, I just turn something on and let it just balance. But if you want to try to bring something up that's not under load, you could write a strategy that would divert like 10% of the task to that server to make sure that it was up and running and stable before you spun it up full way. Um, we're not doing that right now. Um, and uh, it also does, it also aggregates monitoring. So I talked about how every API has a status line. Vasco provides Vasco basically watches all the servers that have registered with it, aggregates that status, and provides it on a single endpoint so that I can just get a, get a big status block from everybody. And it also gives me, if everything is up and running and returning 200s on the status, then there's, there's a single endpoint which just returns either a 200 OK or a 500 something's wrong, and I hook up Amazon's load balancer to that and also the you know ping services and stuff so that it's really easy for all the ping systems to say oh something's wrong page somebody um, and then finally um, we're doing um, like the cores cross origin stuff for the router I'm just handling that at Vasco basically at the gateway it says can you handle this and it says yes um, and the token validation stuff that is happening at the gateway so that a request doesn't reach my endpoint servers if it didn't pass the token validation for login, um, which means that it, you know I can just basically dump it at the door and not let it inside the firewall. Um, and then it's designed right now with a memory data structure, but the memory data structure was designed to mimic the Redis API. <laughs> so when I go to need more than one of them, then I'm going to go back and put Redis in. Um, just a couple example services that we've built. A static service just provides a web server. That was like five lines of Go, um, plus support for Vasco. Um, and also then I added to that a fast KV store, since I don't currently have Redis up and running, just, a, just an easy way for um, services to, to store value and get it back. Um, the user service, which manages the login and OAuth authentication and stuff like that. And then we have a bunch of specialized data services that, that provide the, our internal systems and, and API. Um, I can probably skip most of this. Oh, I guess one of the things that's interesting is all of the, the Vasco client service isn't required. So all of these systems will come up and ask Vasco what they should use for a port, and Vasco will dole out a port, and then um, so they won't collide with each other, and then um, and then register themselves with Vasco. But if Vasco isn't there, they can't find it. They will just come up on port 8080, just and you can also specify that on the command line if you want to. So if you just want to run one standalone in your own machine for testing, it does that just fine. Um, and everything has unit tests for lots of pieces, but we've done integration tests, um, not as many as I should have. I'm, I'm working on writing more of those, and that's one of those kind of like one day a week I take some time and, and, uh, and try to add some more tests to the framework so that they're better. Um, it's, when I was at Tide Pool, it became important to run all of the services at once so that you could run a local stack. At um, Anet, I'm not finding that need yet, so I haven't built all the tooling to let to make it easy to bring up and down a stack. Um, but it's again, 
the state of an active you know service under development where we are not a big deal for anybody um, so a couple of takeaways for you know what what I mean when I say microservices is you know break it up into pieces small enough to rewrite in two weeks somebody said this today on one of the go channels and I thought that's a really good uh, is that you no that's from the O'Reilly book Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I like it too. Um, and and somebody today said that they have an internal company policy where if the guy who wrote a server leaves, then you assign it to somebody else to rewrite because they're small enough to do that. And that way you don't have knowledge walk out the door permanently. Um, that's kind of cool. Um, and I think of all the stuff we have, there's probably only one I couldn't rewrite in two weeks. Um, they don't always take two weeks to get to that point, but you know when you boil them down and run around them a couple of times, you know they're usually like if you have a spec, you can sit there and re regenerate it pretty quickly. Um, don't keep local state. That's just like that way lies madness. Um, and anything that changes on deploy, keep it in a separate, keep it in config, and you know keep your binaries separate from. Your, your configuration, and you'll be a lot happier. So um, that's me. As I said, I'm hiring. Um, we're, we're looking for somebody senior who can handle front end and back end. Uh, actually, the back end is kind of optional for this job. <laughs> uh, be nice to have additional back end resources, but, but really, we need a good Angular engineer. So if you know anybody, give me a ring. Um, and uh, I'll post this talk for anybody who wants it. Any other questions? Yeah. Actually, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your service discovery. Yeah. Um, so what are you using? I mean, is, it, is it just you know, your own data store, and everybody goes to that, to that point to learn about services? Yeah, so there's a ser the server we call Vasco, and actually its documentation badly needs updating. But it is open source on the Achievement Network um, site. They, um, the company's, the company's pretty good. They, they uh, um, keeping some things proprietary, but they've allowed me to open source the stuff that isn't critical to our customer base. And so Vasco is one of those things. And um, so it, it is a service that runs just the same model as all these other things. Its API. There's a, it actually serves its API on two endpoints. Um, one is on the internal um, uh, IP, and the other is on the external IP. So the external IP is just a is just a reverse proxy. So a request comes in, it figures out where it's supposed to go, it forwards it. Everything that isn't matched goes to the static server, and the static server deals with it. Um, and um, anything else gets forwarded, and then the results come back, um, and in the internal endpoint supports several URLs that map to tell you who I am. Uh, this is the pattern of APIs that I want to match, um, and you know, so so you can have like I have one endpoint that serves three different basic patterns, as well as um, and then as I said, the static the static server special case. Anything else? Anything you don't know what to do with? Look for the thing called static and send that. Um, and um, and then on the discovery side, one of the internal URLs is you say I'm looking for the static server, and it'll tell you back which IP it's at. So if you want to talk to it directly without going through Vasco, you can do that. Um, but for the most part, we find ourselves we're going through the database for anything that needs. I mean we. We're, I'm really trying to make these services completely in, in, independent as much as possible, and there's a couple of instances where they, where like, um, you know, this server for this kind of data needs to talk to a server for that kind of data, and so right now I'm routing that through a standard URL, and if it turns out to become a performance issue, then I can I can take this service discovery route. Um, and um, I'm a big fan of Memcache and Redis, depending on your needs. Redis is great. Um, so that's a good way to communicate um, quickly or to store things so that you can get to them later. Um, did that answer what you were asking? Yeah. Okay. 
Anybody else? Cool. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming, um, and thanks to uh, Dave and Kent for presenting. It was awesome. Welcome. Uh, we do these uh, last, last Tuesday every month, pretty much. Uh, we haven't announced the next meetup yet, but um, I'm looking actively for topics. So if you're interested in speaking about anything Go-related, uh, just let us know. Um, there's actually a list of topics in the meetup group, so if you need ideas, we have some ideas. Um, and thanks for coming. Oh, and take some pizza. We always have leftover pizza, so... Thank you.